want Jesus to return. We're ready to go home. Father, I pray for this sermon that it is you and, and the people see you in Jesus' name. Amen. Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 14 if you're not already there. And you also need the sheet of scriptures that is found in the bulletin. And we're going to be flipping around a bit between Luke and John. So you want to keep your finger there in Luke and John. That's where we're going to spend our time. And then there's a few more Bible verses that you will need. And to set the scene for Luke 14, 15, it's Sabbath day. And Jesus is in the house of one of the chief Pharisees. And as always, he's teaching, he's preaching, he's doing everything he can to get people to, to him, to point people to God. And as he's doing so, in verse 15, somebody cries out, one of the men says, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of heaven. Blessed is he that will eat bread in the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who will be in heaven. Blessed are those who have eternal life. All the pain, all the suffering, all the heartache that we go through, it's going to be worth it. It's going to be more than worth it. It's a tremendous honor to be invited home to God's house. It's a tremendous honor to be with God and live with Jesus. And in John 14, verse 2, and keep your finger there in Luke because we'll be back. John 14, verse 2, Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. In other words, many wonderful, fantastic rooms. There's plenty of room in God's house. There's plenty of room for everybody who wants to be there. Anybody who wants to be there. He says, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus is using the illustration of a Jewish wedding. And he says that there's plenty of room in his father's house. Plenty of room for anybody who wants to be there. It's a tremendous honor to be invited to God's home. It's a tremendous honor, and there's plenty of room for everybody. Unfortunately, not everybody views it as such a blessing. Unfortunately, not everybody who says, I really want to be there, really wants to be there. Oh, they may say that they do. They may say that Jesus is number one. They may say that God means more to them than anything. But when it comes right down to it, there's something more important in their lives. There's some distraction. It's the title of this sermon. In Luke 14, back to Luke 14, verse 16 and 17. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. In verse 16, a man, probably a rich man, decides he's going to put on a feast. And like everybody who's throwing a party, you want to get a pretty good idea of who's going to be there. You need to know how much food to buy, how much entertainment. So in verse 16, he's making the guest list. And when it says that he bade many, he's basically asking them to RSVP. So the people in this parable have committed, yes, we're going to be there. We will be there at the feast. We guarantee it. And then in verse 17, everything's ready. So he sends his servant out, and he goes to all the people one by one, telling them, it's ready. Time is ready. Get ready for the feast. And Jesus is sending his servants now. The feast is ready. Everything's ready. Get ready. Let's go home. Let's go to the feast. Let's live forever with him. Matthew 24, 44 in your scripture sheet. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Jesus says, get ready. Jesus says, be ready. Make sure you are ready. Make sure there's nothing in your heart, nothing in your life to come between you and God. Be ready. Be ready. 
In verse 18, Luke 14, 18. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I've bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. When the time comes and the servant goes to each house, they all say, sorry, we can't come. Even though they had previously committed, we're going to be there. Even though they had said, what a great honor this is. What a great privilege this is. When it comes right down to it, there was something more important. Now, this man here, he says, well, I've just bought a piece of ground. I've got to go check it out. I'm sorry, I just can't come. Now, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make a bit of sense. Surely he had checked out the ground before he bought it. Surely he had a real good idea of what this ground would do before he bought it. And even if he didn't, it's just dirt. It's just dirt, right? It's not like it's going to rot. It's not like it's going to disintegrate or anything. He could have easily gone to the feast and a few days later and come and check it out. But it just showed it was an excuse. There was something more important than the feast. There was something more important than what he had committed to. And how many Christians? Oh, they say they love God. They say they love Jesus. They say they're going all the way with him, taking up the cross. But when it comes right down to it, there's something more important. How many people, like this guy, houses, lands, cars, possessions, means more to them than the kingdom of heaven, means more to them than Jesus. Now, you might remember the story of Naaman. And in your sheet there, we've got some Bible verses. We'll get to in just a second. But Naaman... He was the, the five-star general of Syria. He was the head of the army, and the Bible's quite clear that God had given him tremendous victories. Well, he was wealthy. He was popular. Everybody knew him, but he, he got leprosy. He contracted leprosy. And in those days, leprosy was the worst. There was no cure. It was a slow, painful death, and he doesn't know what to do. Well, to make a long story short, okay, I'm summing this up. He ends up down in Israel, and he's standing at prophet Elisha's house. And Elisha sends word to him, go dip in the Jordan River seven times, and you'll be healed. Well, he throws a bit of a fuss, but he ultimately does that, and he's healed. He's absolutely healed. And he's so thankful, and he's so grateful. He comes back to prophet Elisha's house, and he's got all this money he wants to give to Elisha. I'm so thankful. Here, take all this gold and silver. Elisha says, no, no, we're not taking a penny. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but the reason was that God's forgiveness, God's gifts of healing are free. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. We don't deserve it. He was trying to teach this man God's grace, God's forgiving mercy. In 2 Kings 5.20, we read, But Gehazi. So many times in Scripture, when we read that first word there, but, what a disaster. What a disaster. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master has spared Naaman the Syrian, and not receiving at his hands, that which he hath brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. Gehazi sees all that money, sees all that gold, all those jewels, and his eyes just light up in dollar signs. He's saying, I want some of that. And you notice he brings God's name into this. And how many Christians are bringing God's name into their sin? As the Lord liveth, I'm going to work on Sabbath day because i got to feed my family. God wants me to. As the Lord liveth, I'm going to divorce my spouse because God wants me to be happy. How many of us are bringing God's name into our sin? In verse 21. So Gehazi followed after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from his chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? 
Now, in those days, they were in pretty good shape, not like, you know, today. And so, ne- so Gaze- Gehazi goes running after Naaman. And he's so fast that he easily catches up to the chariot. And as he catches up to the chariot, Naaman looks back. He sees him. He says, let's stop here. What's going on? And in verse 22, he said, all is well. My master hath sent me, saying, Behold, even now there come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of raiment. He tells an absolute lie. And those who are chasing after money, those who are chasing after wealth and property are ultimately going to sin. Somehow, some way, you're a Christian, you say you love God, but you ultimately love money, property more than you love God, you're going to sin. That's just the way it is. The devil will make sure of it. And he's, he's really good at telling stories. And I wish Maurice was here, because if we needed someone else to do children's story, we'll sign up Gehazi. But it shows you what greed does to us. What does greed got, does to us? We go chasing after sin. We go running after money. We should go running after God. We should be running to his house. We should be running to our knees in prayer. In verse 23. And Naaman said, Be content, take two talents. And he urged him, and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments, and lay them upon two of his servants, and they bear them before him. Now Gehazi asked for one talent of silver and a couple changes of clothing, and Naaman, he's so thankful. He's so grateful. He says, here, take two. Just take more. Take more. And it just shows that those people whose hearts have been changed, whose hearts have been touched by the Holy Spirit, They're not saying, what's the bottom line? What's the minimum I can do? What's the minimum I can give? They're saying, how much more can I give to God's cause? How much more can I do for God? They're not saying, you mean I got to pay tithe? They're checking their bank account, squeezing every penny out that they can for God's cause. Their hearts have been changed. Their hearts have been touched by the Holy Spirit. Now, I know what time of year it is. When the nominating committee comes to them, they're not saying, no, no, thank you. They're saying, what more can I do for God? What more can I do for the church? They're checking their schedule. They're doing everything they can. What can I do for God? When your heart has been touched by the Spirit of God, when your heart has been changed by God, you're saying, how can I sacrifice? How can I give? What more can I do for God's cause? When your heart hasn't been changed, you're saying, no, thank you. When your heart hasn't been changed, you're holding on to your money. What a difference. What a difference. 2 Kings 5, 24. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house, and he let the men go when they departed. But he went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went no whither. So Gehazi has it pretty good. Not only do the servants take the money, and the servants take the change of the garment, but they carry it all the way back to his house for him. He then lets them go, and he stands before his master. Elisha says to him, where did you go? Giving him a chance to confess. And he says, I haven't been anywhere. And again, it shows what greed will do to us. We will lie. We will cheat. We will deceive. We get so wrapped up in money. We get so wrapped up in things rather than the Spirit of God. In verse 26, and he said to him, Went not my heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it a time to receive money and to receive garments 
and all of yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants. The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. As Gehazi goes before the prophet, the prophet says, where have you been? He says, I haven't been anywhere. And the prophet just lays it right on the line. Is this really the time? Is this really the time to get money and wealth and be all wrapped up in these things? Shouldn't we be wrapped up in the kingdom of God? Shouldn't we be wrapped up in commitment and love to Jesus? Isn't that what our lives and our hearts should be all about? Clearly, that's not what Gehazi was all about. Now, as his punishment, he became a leper. And some people have questioned that. They thought, well, isn't that pretty harsh? Isn't that pretty harsh? But remember, he totally ruined the sign, the symbol of salvation. As Naaman had walked away from there, he was amazed that God's mercy was free. Forever, his thought was going to be, I was healed for free. And Gehazi ruined that. He ruined the whole thought of salvation and God's free gifts. So he deserved it. And leprosy was the sign, the symbol of sin, and it showed what his heart was all about. This servant was not about the things of God. He was about sin. He was wrapped up in money, wrapped up in wealth, rather than wrapped up in Jesus. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but I can't help but wonder. You might remember that previous to this, Elijah was the great prophet. He was the great prophet, and Elisha was his servant. Elisha was in training to be the next great prophet. When Elijah went to heaven, Elisha took over as the, as the next great prophet. We see here that Gehazi is the servant. Was he in training to be the next great prophet? You read the scriptures, there was not another great prophet after that. It very well could have been Gehazi. He may have been in training to be the next great prophet, and he got wrapped up in sin. God had great plans for him, and he ruined it by his sins. And some church members wonder, well, why doesn't God use me? How come God can't seem to use me? Could it be our sins? Could it be that God has great plans for us? That God wants to use us, but we're wrapped up in money, we're wrapped up in things, we're wrapped up in pleasure, rather than wrapped up in Jesus? Luke 14, 19. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. The servant goes to the next man, and this man says, well, sorry, I can't come. I just bought ten oxen, and i got to go check them out. Now, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense either. These were oxen. Surely he had a really good idea of what they could do before he bought them. And even if he didn't, they're just oxen. They're just kind of like big overgrown cows. They're still going to be big cows in two or three days. He could have easily gone to the feast and then come back and checked them out. But it's just an excuse. Just an excuse. And it shows how some people, they're into their possessions. They're into things. They're into something other than God, rather than Jesus. Jesus warns us in Matthew 5, 29. says, and this is in your sheet. And if thy right eye offend thee, Pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. In other words, if something that you're looking at, if something that you're looking at is causing you to sin, something on the internet, something on TV, somebody walking down the street, if it causes you to sin, get rid of it. Now, Jesus doesn't mean, you know, gouge your eyes out, but he means get rid of the thing. He says it is profitable. It's to your advantage. If something is causing you to sin, get rid of it. Get rid of it. 
He continues in verse 30 saying, And if thy right hand, if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. It is profitable to thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. If something that you're doing, something you're doing is causing you to sin, Jesus says, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Don't let it keep you out of heaven. Don't let it keep you out of the kingdom of God. The devil might tell you how great it is. The devil might tell you how wonderful this thing is. Jesus says, get rid of it. Jesus says, it might just keep you out of heaven. And then in Mark 9, 45, he says, and if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. If somewhere we are going, an activity we're participating in, is coming between us and God, get rid of it. You don't want to miss heaven. You don't want to miss eternal life. Luke 14, 20. And another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Now this third man, he says, sorry, I just got married, I can't come. Sounds like he just kind of slammed the door in the servant's face. Now, again, that doesn't make sense. This feast was at a rich man's house, and he had plenty of food and plenty of entertainment. Surely the man could have said, I, I just got married, can I bring my wife? I mean, he didn't even try. He didn't even try. It was just an excuse, and it shows how some people prefer family, friends, people, over Jesus, over the kingdom of heaven. They may say they love God. They may be in church every Sabbath, but ultimately, there's somebody they put first. Adam loved Eve over God, kind of got us in this mess in the first place. I can remember one time, somebody said to me, you know, as much as I want to be in heaven, I'm not sure I want to be there if my kids aren't there. Now, I... I kind of understand. I mean, I'm married. In case you don't know, my wife's sitting over there. She's the cute one in the back row there. And I love her. And I got kids. One of them's here today. Love my kids dearly. But the Bible says we love Jesus first. We love God first. Sorry, but our spouses are second. I'm second to her. Sorry, but our kids are second. They are second to us. We love God first. And the best thing we can do is get right with Jesus first. And then we pray so hard for our kids to be saved. Then we work so hard for our spouses to be saved. We work so hard for others to be saved. But we love God first. We must put God first in everything. I think another good lesson there. If the people that we're hanging out with, if we can't bring them to church... It could be that maybe we shouldn't be hanging out with them. Maybe they are influencing us rather than us influencing them. Now, I realize that we got to reach our hand out to the lost. Amen. But we want to make sure that we're influencing them rather than them dragging us down. It's the last thing we want. As we consider these three men, uh, in your sheets here, 1 John 2.15 Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If anybody loves the sins of the world, if we, even though we're church members, if we, even though we say we love God, if we ultimately love the sins of the world, he says here, the love of the Father is not in us. For all, continue, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. There are things out there that look so good, and feel so good, and taste so good, and sound so good, and smell so good, and they give us such a thrill. They're so exciting. They give us such a great thrill. But Jesus says they're sin. 
Jesus says they will keep us out of the kingdom of heaven. They may last 40 years, 60 years, 70 years, but heaven is forever. Eternal life is just that. It's eternal life. As Jesus tells us, cut the things off. Cut the sins off. Let them go. They're dragging us down. It's not worth missing heaven over. In Luke 14, 21 to 23. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. The servant, he comes back and he reports what's happened. And this man, he's not very happy because he spent all this time and all this money preparing the feast and everybody's backing out. So he says to his servant, just go out and invite everybody. Go invite everybody and anybody. We, we got to fill my house. And Jesus says, go invite everybody. Go invite anybody. Compel them to come in. Show them how great it is to be a Christian. Show them how great my love is. How wonderful it is to serve me. Show them how I will give them eternal life and they can live forever. Jesus sends his servants out. In Matthew 24, 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Jesus will not return till the gospel goes to everybody. Till everybody hears, and everybody knows, and everybody has the chance. We've got to do what we can. We're servants. We love our Lord. Let's be busy for him. Now in verse 21 again, it says, Then the master of the house being angry. Now we can't blame the master. He's a little bit upset there. But unfortunately, some have taken this to extreme. They say God is an angry God. God is a vicious, cruel God. And he can't wait. He just can't wait to get his hands on us. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Turn over to John 3. We're done in Luke 14. Turn over to John 3, with verse, starting with verse 14. John 3, 14 and 15. Jesus speaking here, and he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus is talking with Nicodemus, one of the great spiritual leaders, and he tells him a spiritual truth that the man should have known. He should have known. God's not an angry God. God's not a vicious God. God is not looking for some excuse to keep people out of heaven. He's striving to get us into heaven. He's striving to save our souls. He's striving to give us eternal life. Jesus reminds Nicodemus of a story that happened, and he reminds him that there was a time when God was leading Israel out of Egyptian bondage. And as well seemed like normal, they were murmuring, they were complaining, and as a result, God could not help or protect the people, and so these poisonous snakes begin to come in the camp. And by the hundreds, by the thousands, people are getting bit, and some are dying, they're in great pain. So God directs Moses to take a bronze serpent, put it up on a pole, and then anybody who chooses to can just look. Just look and be healed. By faith, they are healed. And Jesus says, that is me. That is him. We've been bitten by the serpent of sin. We all need help. We all need a savior. And Jesus bids us, by faith, look to him. By faith, look to the cross. By faith, look to him for forgiveness, for salvation, for eternal life. 
In John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world that the world through him might be saved. God did not send Jesus to condemn us. God is not looking for some reason to keep us out of heaven. He's striving to get us into heaven. He's striving to save our souls. He wants to give us eternal life because he loves us. Because he loves us. Now some people have a mistaken idea of the judgment. They think that, well, they might be good Christians their whole life. And then during the judgment, God finds some loophole to keep them out of heaven. But that's not what the judgment is. It's absolutely not about that. The judgment is to expose our hearts to the universe. Those who really love God, the judgment's going to show they really love God. Those who committed their hearts to Jesus, the judgment's going to show they committed their hearts to Jesus. And those who had distractions, those who were the pretenders... Those who had something else between them and God, judgment's going to show that too. It's going to expose our hearts to the universe. It continues there in John 3, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus is the only way out. He's the only way out. We are in a spiritual prison. We need Jesus. We are under lock and key. We need Jesus. There's no way out but Jesus, the Son of God. That is it. In Luke eleven twenty three, 23, Jesus makes the comment, and it's in your sheet, He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth. In other words, what he's trying to tell us is only those who gather with him, only those who make the decided choice, I'm going to love him, I'm going to serve him, I'm going to confess my sins, I'm going to ask for forgiveness, only those people are gathering with him. Everybody else is scattered. Now, this means that as important as it is that we come to church just because we come to church doesn't mean we've gathered with Jesus. And as important as it is to be baptized, just because we get wet doesn't mean we've gathered with Jesus. And as important as it is to dress up and carry our Bibles, and I hope you do, and I hope you read it a lot, unless we make the decided choice, I'm going to love him, I'm going to serve him, I'm going to commit my all to him, we have not gathered, we have scattered. And I don't think we're going to be able to say, well, Jesus, I was an Adventist. You know, I kept the Sabbath. I did this or that. Unless we make the decided choice, I'm going to love him. I'm going to serve him. I'm going all the way with him. We have not gathered. We've scattered. We've scattered. In John 3, 19. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. The people in the parable ultimately loved darkness. They said they loved God. They said they wanted to be there. But when it came right down to it, they loved something more than Jesus. And we got to understand that we are sinners. We have a sinful nature. And because we are sinners, we are going to be attracted to things that, well, are sinful. We are. That's the way it is. But when we're convicted, when the Holy Spirit has showed us, we got to go to the light. We got to run from our sins. We got to leave our sins. We got to gather with Jesus. Let Him take our sins away from us. Cooperate with Him in the process. Let's be purged. The last thing that we want is something to come between us and God and keep us out of heaven. Yeah, say amen to that, please. 
Now, some have said, but if I just had more, if I just saw an angel, if I just heard the voice of Jesus, that'd be good enough for me. But I don't think we need that. In Romans 1.21, the Apostle Paul is writing. And he says here, because that, when they knew God, now they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful and became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. He's describing the people shortly after the flood. These people had the testimony of Noah. They had the testimony of his sons, of Shem, of Japheth, and even Ham, as rotten as his heart turned out to be. They knew the world was destroyed because of disobedience. They knew that they were the only people left on the earth. They had the eyewitness testimony. They knew what was being said was right. Yet they turned from God. They had all the information and even more, and they turned from God. We don't need to hear the voice of Jesus, except maybe in our hearts. We don't need to see an angel, but we need to dig into the scriptures, see what God has to say, and commit ourselves to following him. Commit ourselves to going all the way with him. Now, some people, they try to reason their way out of things. You know, they hear about sin, they hear about Jesus, and they try to reason their way out. You know, they talk about this, they talk about that. But in John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the only way. He's the only way. It's the only way we're going to be saved. It's a commitment to him, a love for him, a complete dedication to him. Now, some have asked the question, but don't I got to keep the commandments? Don't I got to keep God's commandments to go to heaven? Well, of course you got to keep the commandments. I mean, nobody's going to walk into heaven while they're picking their neighbor's pocket at the same time, right? Nobody's going to go to heaven while at the same time they're eyeing somebody else's spouse. But let's keep this in perspective now. Let's make sure we got this right. John 14, 15. Jesus, he's speaking. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you already love Jesus, if you've already made a commitment to him, if you've already confessed your sins, ask him to forgive, the result, keep his commandments. We're keeping his commandments because we love him. We're keeping his commandments because we serve him. Because we're right with him. That's why we keep his commandments. Romans 8.13 is really even stronger than that. It says, For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit, through the power of the Holy Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. We can't keep God's commandments without his help. We can't put aside sin without his help and his power. But you don't get the Holy Spirit until you're already right with God. So we must be right with God first, and then we go on from there. We get right with him, we love him, we serve him, then we keep his commandments. Now somebody else might say, well, I thought we had to do all these good works. Doesn't our light say we've got to do all these good works to be saved? Well, I can tell you, over the years, a lot of people have said to me, well, Ellen White says this, and then I go read it, and I say, well, I don't think that's what she's saying at all. But the Bible says, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So we must be right with God first. We must make a confession to God first. 
We must gather with Jesus first, and everything else is the result. Be right with God first. Commit your life to God first, and then we go from there. As we close here, as you think about what you've heard, and you consider not what does my spouse need to hear, not what do my kids need to hear, but as you apply it to your own heart, we're going to pray right now. And as we pray, if anybody's saying, Lord, I need to get right with you. Lord, I need help. I need strength. Just, just raise your hand with nobody looking. Let's pray. Father, we know time is short, and we don't want distractions. Move on our hearts. Help us to love you. Help us to serve you. And Father, for those who've raised their hand, give them extra strength, extra power, extra commitment, because we want to come home with you. In Jesus' name, amen.